the Fire It Up with CJ show. Today we have uh, Sybil Chavis, and we are going to be talking about the Inner MBA, which is a program offered by Sounds True. And um, Sybil's going to tell us all about it. So, welcome. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. So, tell me about um, this program. How did? What's the um, birthing story of this lovely product? Well, you know, it's so interesting because it's it begins actually with our founder. Tammy Simon, mm -hmm. and she has you know, been, she founded Sounds True 36 years ago. Wow. And has been in a space, quite honestly, that now conscious business has gotten much more popular, but 36 years ago, that wasn't necessarily the case. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. what she always spoke about was, I really wish I had mentors and people who were going about business with the same type of mentality and principles that I feel are important. Mm. So in addition to the traditional business areas that you're focusing on, you know, really making certain, of course, that you're focusing on the employees and the customers you're serving, but also how are you then thinking about, okay, how is this group of people who are bringing products to the world, how are they learning from each other and growing together? And how are you as an individual showing up every day? Mm -hmm. and doing your own inner work. And then mm -hmm. how does that then really start spilling over in a great way into everything that you do in the work environment, whether it's mm -hmm. something as simple as a email, a PL, a work meeting, the vision that you're setting for the company, the vision that you're setting for your team. Like there needs to be a curriculum about this. Mm -hmm. And like, that's really focused on conscious business. Mm -hmm. And so she's like, I wanted to create the perfect program that I wished I had <laughs> right. when I was growing this business. Right. And that's that's where the idea for the inner MBA was born. It, it was born out of Tammy's genius and understanding that there really is this opportunity for all of us to learn and to grow and to have a curriculum that's teaching us how to do that specifically as it pertains to conscious business. Mm, okay. So I want to go in and first, like, let's just circle back and talk about what specifically is conscious business. How are you defining that? You know, I think everyone has different definitions of it, but I, the shared, you know, golden thread, if you will, that I think runs through everyone is like, how can we really be thoughtful and mindful mm -hmm. about business? How can we think about social impact in what we're creating in the world? How can we think about the good we're putting out there mm -hmm. and making all of this a part of what it means to do good business, mm -hmm. right? Not just your bottom line. Uh, and we went through the, you know, the three bottom lines, that too, but even more than that, like how are we using business really as a force for good in the world? Mm -hmm. and a force for good for ourselves individually as we're growing. To right. me, that's conscious business. It's, you know, it's understanding that it's not about just looking for competitors and what everybody else is doing, but looking for synergies and how are we all aligning even with different companies that are helping us collectively come together and create positive impacts in the world. You've already gone through one round of this program mm -hmm. and you've had like great success with the program and you've had people um, hit these barriers of, of potentially of like, what does conscious business mean? I know a lot of it, since you're in the Bay Area, there are a lot of people from the high tech arena and a lot of startup folks that were in your program. So tell mm -hmm. me a little bit about like, where did the rubber meet the road? Like, when was it that some of the attendees were coming with real kinds of problems that they had in the business world where they were trying to be a force of good, but then mm -hmm. they also had, you know, pressures with making profits, particularly with startups, like they have to be able to make their numbers so that mm -hmm. they go funding again. So, you know, what were some of the typical dilemmas that people had and how did your program help them through them? Right, right. I mean, I think just to address the first issue that you lifted up, and that is startup companies and companies that are like really focused on, okay, how do I drive revenue right. in these next six months? Right. Because this is a crucial time to do it. And coming with that real honest need, desire, and fear 
that if I don't do this, <laughs> I don't know how this company gets off the ground. Right. And what I saw, uh, you know, behind the scenes and getting to sit in Q and A's with a lot of the students, uh, and then also just the direction of a lot of the faculty members is understanding how to connect the dots, right? Okay. And so there really is this connection between conscious business and revenue growth. And so starting off in the beginning, you know, if I'm gonna create a company, for example, and I think it's really similar to, in many ways, we launch courses and programs. Mm -hmm. That sounds true. And those are startups. Mm -hmm. And at the beginning of a, a startup, a course launch, we're like, okay, we know that we need to enroll a certain number of people in this program. One, so that there's enough people that they're interacting and learning and growing together, first and foremost, right? It's not nearly as fun <laughs> to learn and grow if there's only three of you <laughs> in right. a program. So right. we are really trying to hit a certain number that allows a program to have a healthy number of participants. Mm -hmm. But then there's also cost for us mm -hmm. internally as a business to create courses, to have faculty members, to have Zoom calls, right. to have learning management systems. There's real hard cost to get these programs off the ground. And so we have real hard financial costs that we know and expenses have to be covered. Right. And there's an understanding that, okay, let's look at this, let's step back and look at this holistically and understand that yes, this needs to make sense on paper financially and we need to do what we've always done from a business standpoint and be really smart about how we're building these programs and looking at scope of work and doing the real traditional, this is how you create an, a great productive and profitable program, mm -hmm. check. But there's another box mm -hmm. and that is the conscious business box. That is understanding to the team and how they're synergizing as they're solving these problems. At like the individual and how they're showing up to lead that team mm -hmm. when the team is maybe paranoid. Like, you know, I'll have, we'll have launch directors who will be helping us bring these courses to the world and they'll, oh my gosh, I'm not going to hit my enrollment goal. The fear of that. Okay. How do we help that marketing director who has to lead this team? How do we help them understand that this is a practice for me to work through my fear? Not right. because this program isn't going to be successful, but because I want to align the team. I want to keep them focused right. on the good energy that we need to put in this course. And to do that, I have to get out of the way personally. I have my own work to do. So really looking at the whole picture and how all of these things and pieces come together to create the perfect launch. And that's, of course, just a, you know, it's very synonymous in my mind to a startup. And it's the same alchemy that you're looking for and just making certain that you're tending to not just the traditional business part, but how do you expand your view and make certain you're also looking to the other inner growth areas, the things that are also going to contribute to the success of the startup. Right. Okay. Got it. So what I'm hearing is, is that um, I'm hearing a couple of different things is one is, you know, there's an operating system of fear. You know, so what I heard in the example that you gave was, mm -hmm. um, gosh, I'm really afraid that we're not going to hit our numbers. And when one yeah. actually, you know, when you're talking about your marketing person or whoever, uh, the course person, they went into a place of fear versus a place of creativity. And so yeah. working with that person so that they move from um, fear and reaction to creativity was what I'm hearing part of what is what a conscious business does. And so to me, that's more like you're conscious of the people um, in addition to the process of making money, but it's conscious mm -hmm. of the people who are making the product and how they're doing throughout the whole process. So that's part of um, the whole picture, right? It's not only the task and the actual task of launching, but also the relationships and the people and keeping kind of a whole system that's part of it. So I see that as being conscious business. And when you say it's a force of good, I, I understand how it's a force of good for your own organization, right? Mm -hmm. But how is 
How is what you're doing a force of, I mean, I know yours is a little bit hard, easier to figure out how you're a force of good, sure. but um, how do you make sure that in the end that you're doing more good than harm when you're a startup, mm-hmm. you know? So part of it is, is balancing task and relationship. I'm hearing that's part of the equation. What else is part of the equation to know that you're being a force of good? You know, I think for me personally, I can speak and it's really reflecting and having my own awareness of what I'm doing and why I'm doing it and who am I doing it for from the beginning, you know, before I even decide I'm going to create a startup or I'm going to join a startup, like, you know, and different questions, I think, depending on if you're the founder of the startup or if you're someone who's joining a startup early on. Mm -hmm. But those reflection questions, you know, is this aligned with my values Mm -hmm. and purpose? Do I feel like I can really help in a way that's needed? Is there going to be a positive impact with me pouring my energy and my attention into this project, into this business? And I think just starting off with that real open inquiry is the way I've always gone about it with myself Mm -hmm. to just make certain I'm aligning with the steps I'm supposed to take next. Okay, so let's actually take your your, yours as a perfect example because (laughs) okay, okay, tell us a little about the program as well. So, you know, at the time when you were trying to decide, so um, um, you've had a really um, interesting and powerful background, starting with being in law, um, graduating from Harvard Law School, going to University of Michigan, and then being a vice president of um, a multinational. Uh, it was an advertising agency. Exactly. So, so you have all this kind of background. Sure. Um, if you kind of look back at your life as it was, um, how did you know that there was, you know, like, was there a, a change in like, wait, this isn't really aligning. And how did you know what pivots to make? Like what values did you care about? And how did you arrive at, um, at your current place? <laughs> that's, a, that's a doozy of a question. An awesome question though, because you know, I don't, I can't say I always had the answers, Mm -hmm. but I was always open and willing to listen and to find them within myself. So as you said, you know, I started off really traditionally. I went to law school. I accumulated a couple hundred thousand dollars of student loans. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And that set a certain path forward for me. I have to pay off these student loans. Right. Everyone in my law school class is going to traditional law firms. I shouldn't say everyone, but 99% of people are going this traditional route. Okay, that means I'm supposed to go to a law firm. Okay, I go to this law firm. Now I'm sitting in this law firm, year one, feeling like a fish out of water. Mm. Not that I don't have total respect for my colleagues and the law, the practice of law, but for me, it wasn't where I was ultimately supposed Mm. to be. Mm -hmm. And I had to have that moment of reckoning and Mm. just be open and say, okay, something's a little off. Mm -hmm. Something's a little off and asking those questions because I didn't necessarily have the answer. I just knew something was off. Mm. And so being willing to acknowledge that and then to search, okay, what's, what's something I feel more aligned with? that I'm Mm -hmm. supposed to do because I can feel that this is off and then being willing to take a leap of faith. And that's when I jumped to the advertising agency and went in house because I'm like, Oh, I'm doing business. I'm working with creative folks. Mm. This is feeling different. This is stimulating me in a way Mm. that I wasn't necessarily stimulated before. This is allowing me to feel alive. Mm -hmm and learn and grow. And so I did that for 10 years. And then after 10 years (laughs) at the advertising agency, and I'm an attorney, so I'm not just, you know, I'm risk averse by nature. Right, right. But but I'm also just always open and willing to say like, what is this moment asking for? Mm. How am I supposed to grow? Even if that means I have to change things up, I'm always willing to do that. It's not that I'm not, scared and I don't have fears, but I'm willing. So 10 years I've grown, I've learned so much at the marketing agency and I could feel like there's something more. Mm. 
Mm. I just don't think I'm supposed to sit here and do this for the rest of my life. Like, I feel like I want to contribute more. I want to contribute in different ways. And my husband, Rob, was going through the same thing. We actually went to law school together. We were at the same advertising agency, mm. which we both came to after we worked at the same law firm together. And we're both having this feeling when we're being honest with ourselves that something is off. Mm. So long story short, I go on this business trip because I feel like I want to quit my job, but I'm like, that's crazy. Like I have created, like I've climbed the quote unquote corporate ladder. I've paid off my student loans. Right. I've done everything that I'm supposed to do. I'm married. I have a child. We have bills. We have responsibilities. But like, you know, step by step, we're making it happen. But I feel like something's off and I want to quit my job. <laughs> so I go on this business trip and I'm fearful because I don't, I just feel like, is this really what I'm supposed to do? Mm -hmm. And I walk into the hotel room and there's a sign five feet just staring me in the face. And it says, life is about creating yourself. Mm. And in that moment, something about that sign just really aligned with what I knew I needed to do. It was like a, another wake up call. And it was, a, it was like a vote of confidence. Mm. You do get to continually create the things that you feel like you're meant to be, bring into the world. Mm -hmm. And it's okay if you change things up. Yep. Like, and so I went home and Rob and I quit our jobs on the same day and jumped into the vast unknown. And, you know, I'd say all the time, it was one of the hardest, best decisions of my life, but that was me just being open to like, what is this moment asking for, you know, and how can I grow in the ways I'm supposed to, how am I supposed to show up today to this moment? And then being willing, even if it takes a little while to build up the courage, but being willing to build up that courage to make changes, if that's what in my heart, I'm feeling like I'm being asked to do. And I, so we got here because we were talking about one of the key things as a leader has been for you to get a clarity with your awareness and asking, who am I? What value am I bringing? And so we talked about your journey where you've done that several times, right? From going from law school where you just kind of just, I think all of us do this. You just follow the path that has been given to you. This is the traditional path, follow, you know, follow the traditional path. And then feeling, and what's interesting about, um, and, and I'm drawing this out a little bit because I think people are at a, a, an incredible pivot point right now. COVID, has given us an opportunity to stay at home, go inside, go inside our own homes, like in, mm -hmm. in the deepest part of our hearts and recognize that actually the job that I've been doing for the last 10 years, 15 years, I don't even like anymore. I don't even know right. why I'm doing this job anymore. So I've, because I'm a career coach, I'm hearing more and more people coming to me with this like moment of reckoning and so mm -hmm. I, I love what you described as your own personal journey there which was um one like logically there was nothing wrong and everything was right like you know i'm i'm right. paying off my bills i'm risk averse i have family responsibilities and this is i think something we all face so it's like it logically but then there is a felt sense again going back to relationships like the process at hand and the relationships, like how am I relating to myself? Something feels mm -hmm. off and then moving to the next thing until that same thing where there is like a feeling like something was off, even though logically everything was there. And then signs, which people always talk about, well, how do I know? And there'll be literally, like literally for you, it was a sign, you know, like a little... <laughs> poster or whatever that was with the with the with the kind of message of life is about creating yourself so you know because and I think it's and I think it's the courage to to go out and do that so when you're making that courageous step of just walking into the unknown which and you both your husband and you were going walking through the step of just leaving everything and walking into the unknown which mm -hmm. a lot of people are doing right now as they're quitting their jobs and 
what kind of advice do you have to give to people who are going through that period? And it's, I think you're right. I think that we're at a point in time where a lot of people have been home and have had this time to reflect, you know, because the world has gotten more quiet than it normally has been for a long time. I, I can say that for myself personally. And that to me is where the best advice I feel like I continually follow for myself that I can give is really to take that time to create specific moments, blocks of time in your day where you're just being quiet and tuning in. You know, I say like have a time in. And I am an advocate, like I used to always just and continue to, I just ask myself big questions. <laughs> and I'm, I'm not gonna necessarily have the answer, but you know, I'm gonna wake up in the morning. I'll wake up in the morning and I, that's when I have my quiet time. I have a 15 year old and a 10 year old. So after my house turns on, it turns on. <laughs> All right. But in, in the morning it's quiet. Mm -hmm. and it's before they've gotten up they haven't you know everybody's still asleep and it's just quiet and so I'll go and I'll maybe I'll read I'll listen to some music and I'll just kind of quietly start entering into the day mm -hmm. and then after I feel like I'm relaxed and calm and grounded if I'm going through one of those times in my life, and as you pointed out, I've gone through a couple <laughs> where I'm looking for answers and I'm like, okay, it may be time to make a change. I'll ask myself that question. Mm -hmm. You know, Sybil, what, what feels right? Mm -hmm. what, uh, you know, what have you seen around you? Have you gotten signs that you maybe didn't want to see because you didn't want to create a change? Mm -hmm. hey, what? What do you feel like you're supposed to do next? Mm -hmm. Why are you here? Right. <laughs> like big questions, you know, why did you start off as a lawyer? Why do you have this skill set? Mm -hmm. What can you do with it that can help other people? That's where I started off when I was trying to determine what I'm going to do after the law firm with mm -hmm. was just big questions and giving myself time to sit think through them, go on walks, journal about them. But then here's the key. After I started figuring out like one answer or two answers, I didn't necessarily have the full picture. Like, oh, I'm supposed to go and work. It sounds true. <laughs> I didn't right. have all of that, right? right? But I had, okay, I really want to be in the social impact space. And I want to work with authors that are helping and sharing good information. And so what I would do every morning after I had more answers is I'm like, what is one thing that I can do today mm -hmm. to take a step forward, like a big step forward towards this goal, mm -hmm. towards this new place I want to be? Even if it's like, I'm going to just spend 30 minutes trying to figure out all of the different places that are doing social impact. Like whatever that is, I would wait. Like I just look for that fresh thing every morning. And I still do this, you know, because we all have this like to-do list, right? Mm -hmm. So I've got my to-do list and it's all organized. But I'm like, I want to capture that thing every morning mm -hmm. that just rises up to me. And it's like, this is going to be a big step forward today. So do the three or four things, whatever you have on your to-do list and do this. Mm -hmm. And so always figuring out, okay, what's that one thing I can actually do today that's moving me forward towards a goal or towards a place I think I'm supposed to be. Mm -hmm. That has been something that has really helped me always make progress right. and not just get caught up in the day-to-day -day and just being in motion. Yeah. So we got here by asking, you know, so beyond, um, you know, you talk about conscious business and what I'm hearing you say is it starts with yourself. It's being conscious yourself, being self-aware yourself and getting clarity with like, you know, those just gigantic metaphor, metaphysical questions like, who am I? Why am I here? What are my strengths and skills? How can I use all of these things for the betterment of society? And so um, we're going to circle back to your program, which exactly does that, right? I mean, when I've looked through the curriculum of your inner MBA, 
I mean, there's some people who have um, the temperament to do like a lot of introverts I know would love the process that you talked about. And they're like, oh, I'd love to do that. I'd Fair enough. And extroverts would <laughs> be like, oh, I'm never going to do that. Instead, I would call up my friends, walk around, find up excuses to do. But what I, what I, what I, but what I think is lovely is that your program is designed for both. You know, you can actually go to the inner MBA, take the program, do the quiet introspection or be in community and Mm -hmm. kind of discover and explore those areas. And so the presupposition in all of this is that, you know, it's important to understand who you are when you're running a business and self-awareness is so critical. And we see that over and over again in any leadership um, research that you do is that it, the most important thing is that the leader becomes self-aware so or be self-aware. So I'm curious when you've had people go through this program, they're going through, you're actually stepping them through the, the methodology through being aware of yourself. Now that you're aware of yourself, being aware of yourself when you're connecting to others. Now that you're aware of yourself and connecting with others, how does that connect with the greater good? I mean, so this is like the circles of things that, you know, from inside to all the way to the um, concentric circles around you. So when you when people have done exactly what you are prescribing in your program and that you described yourself, what are you seeing as the differences? Like how do they change? How does their leadership change when they're clearer? You know, from what I have seen, because there were a lot of people who came into the inner MBA mm-hmm. in a place that I felt I was when I was looking for more clarity with like, do I actually quit my job? Do I actually go for this? Like, I want this, but this just feels just far-fetched. It feels like, is this actually gonna happen? Like I have a very stable, practical job in corporate America. Right. There are a lot of people who showed up at that, but they're like, but I also have a dream. (laughs) Like I always have wanted to do X or I've always wanted to do Y. I've always wanted to do Z. And what I have seen transform in that particular person and probably I paid a lot of attention to that person because it was, that was yeah, me yeah. so many years ago, is coming into a program and looking for that confidence mm-hmm. that it's okay to go after what you want. Mm. And what I saw happen too is all of the literature and the videos and the teachings and the Q and A's that they were going through and then just being around other students gave them that confidence and reassured them like, yeah, like you're not crazy for wanting to change things up. Like you are supposed to go for this. Yeah. Like, you're, you're supposed to go for this. Like that is what you're supposed to do. Mm-hmm. And really just landing in on the insight, you know, and this is, this has been a huge insight for me as well. It's like, there's only one you right? Like we all have something special that we're supposed to bring into the world. And there may be three or five things over the course of our lifetime, like really big things. But the reality is based on your experience, based on who you are, based on what you're doing, based on your ambition, based on your vision, only one person can do it exactly like you. Mm -hmm. And so the opportunity we all have is to align with that and to honor that and to figure it out and to know it may evolve over time and shift and change and grow in many beautiful ways, but to know it's something that we want to lean into and go after. So I think what I saw that I thought was just awesome was that reassurance for so many people in that program that you know, were living the corporate dream or living their business dream, Mm -hmm. but they didn't want it anymore. Mm -hmm. And they got the license, the confirmation. It's all right for me to go off and do this thing. Yeah, you know, and then, yeah, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, and then also just to be, make it real practical. Like, okay, it's great. I'm sitting around, I'm dreaming. Okay, now I'm confident I want to do this. Okay, but how do I actually go about doing it? Right. Right, like, and who are these people that I'm in class with that are aligned with me that maybe also want to partner with me or network with me. And so I got to see people making relationships Mm. and building new ideas and businesses together and really collaborating in ways Mm. that 
are gonna extend far after the program so that they are working together, maybe as a support network, maybe literally together on new ideas and initiatives that are more aligned with what they felt they were too scared to do before they started the program. You know, um, this is reminding me, um, and I know that this isn't the frame that you're putting on it, but I'm just gonna put it on just because I think it actually adds some um, a kind of a framework almost for the thing that you're talking about. Um, I was learning about the Bodhisattva path and the Bodhisattva mm -hmm. path is there people who come to earth to come and I, I may be completely butchering. So please, Buddhists, please, all Buddhists and Lord, please forgive me. <laughs> please forgive me for my sins. I'm sure just by the nature that they're Buddhists, they'll forgive you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but it's something along the lines of like, they're here to bring, you know, bring people and have them go, you know, rise from their suffering. Right? This, this is the basic idea. And so people have attained a certain amount of awareness and they are going to bring other people to this higher level of awareness. And um, the process, as it has been explained to me, is the first is um, self-identification. So it's the who am I and getting complete clarity on who I am, which is part of your program. Mm -hmm. And then after um, you get clarity with who am I, what are my what is my soul yearning for? What are the unique contributions that I alone have been given a sacred mission to fulfill? Love you know, that. I was designed in a particular way, navigated my life with these specific experiences because I actually have a soul mission that is sacred and that mm -hmm. I was brought here to do, right? You can use free will and not do it, or you can do it. So sure. I see that part of the value of your program is getting really 100% clarity on identify. Maybe you can't get 100%, but like even 70% is close enough because as you said, you'll, you'll learn as you navigate around, like you didn't know, you knew, you knew law, but then you did, you know, then you went to average. Right. And so you, it, it's kind of, mm, there's very few people that I've seen in my career that just like nail it the first shot. They may have like, I knew I wanted to be a doctor from the age five and I'm like a doctor forever for the rest of my life. Right. Those true. people make these kind of, you know, they make these choices and they, they kind do. of, they pivot close to where they're supposed to be through doing the thing that you just mentioned, right? Getting clear with who they are, how they feel and navigating mm -hmm. with their feelings and brain to figure out where they want to go next. But mm -hmm. self-identification is the first part of this Bodhisattva path. The second is self-esteem, mm -hmm. feeling confident that I can do it. I'm meant to do this. I can do this. I'm getting support to do this because, you know, this is the right thing to do. And so part of what I'm hearing your program does is exactly that, right? It's having other people around going like, yes, you are there, right? right? Yes. And yes. Then, yeah. So I think and then the last part is self-advocacy and, you know, uh, each result will vary. So, you know, this is like the little legal disclaimer, <laughs> but, <Yeah. laughs> but what I've seen like 90% of the time with my clients is when you get clarity, once you feel confident in your choices, then there's self-advocacy, meaning like things show up out of the ether. Like they, I, you don't even know why you're not sure of what, but like all of a sudden, boom, you know, like anytime I've had this happen in my life, all of a sudden, two contracts from I don't even know where come in and fill my whole year, right. whole two years full right. of stuff that I find very valuable, interesting, and it's like enriching me. And I can't guarantee that will happen to everyone, but a lot of the clients, when they have those first two steps, they have self-identification, self-esteem, then their self-advocacy, as my teacher calls, soul power. You know, there's <laughs> something that comes outside of you that comes to meet you because once you're like, agree. I am in to my soul mission, I'm here, I'm in it 100% and I'm, I'm willing to do the work, I've done the work, please come find me. And then what magnetizes you to you are these opportunities for you to just blossom. So mm -hmm. I think that that's the, I think that's the promise, ultimate promise if when you do this program like an inner MBA is that 
you're given, you know, the self identify you're given the tools, you know, like whether you choose to embrace them or not, you're given the people, whether you choose to embrace them or not is completely your free will. But it seems like you have the structure, the tools, and these phenomenal speakers that are coming to speak about these topics that these are like some of the preeminent people in the world that are talking. Mm -hmm. um, tell us a little bit before we close, like who are some of the speakers that are teaching in the class? Sure, so being, like super excited because there's three different tracks mm -hmm. and there's the first of teachers of faculty and the, the first te like group of teachers are conscious business CEOs, mm -hmm. we call them. It's like the Rose Macarios, the former CEO of Patagonia, Eileen Fisher. So it's really CEOs that have understood how do I actually make conscious business mm -hmm. a real important part of my company, my business, my mission, and how are they living that in their businesses? And how has that also been a direct impact, a positive one on growing revenue, growing their business, growing their brand? And so hearing from leaders who've actually done that and mm -hmm. make it a point to integrate into their business every day is really, really, I think, a powerful part of the program. And so there's that track with all of the conscious business CEOs. And then there's the, uh, the faculty, right? People who have for decades and decades, decades they've been tenured <laughs> in what it means to be a conscious business person in the world? What are the capacities that you want to cultivate? How do you need to see things differently in yourself? Like you pointed to that awareness. Mm -hmm. What is, how do you actually become self-aware in a meeting? Mm -hmm. You know, how do you see your patterns? How do you see what's showing up at work and what's getting in the way, even at home or in your relationship? Like, how do you connect those dots? And like so many people, there's this great professor, Har I mean, from Harvard, Lisa Leahy, who really focuses on the immunity to change. Mm -hmm. And so many of us, in fact, when I was listening to her first <laughs> teaching, like her first session was like, oh my gosh, you like everyone's like, I want to change. But then if you haven't understood that there's gonna be a part of you that's resisting that all the time. And so there's a practice, there's things that you have to do mm -hmm. every single day to really get over the resistance to change that mm -hmm. so often is subtle. And right. unconscious. So just a group of professors, Jeremy Hunter um, from the Peter Drucker School of Management, but just people who are teaching this in the classroom, who have the curriculums, there's the whole faculty group. And then there's a group of trainers who are working with you in small groups, working with the students and really helping you practice these capacities. Um, and specifically like the spiritual teachers and the mindfulness mm -hmm. teachers that are, okay, how do I actually embody this mm -hmm. when I want to freak out? How right. do I, how do I get grounded? How do I, yeah. like, how do I really do that in a corporate meeting? Yeah. And I'm in a corporate yeah. meeting and I want to rip someone's head <laughs> off. Right. We're about what to send the flame mail. What do I do instead? What do I do? So yeah. those are the three, the three different tracks of trainers and uh, faculty. Yeah. Okay. So the program is starting when, and how do I sign up if I'm interested? If you're interested, please, it starts in September, but drop by InnerMBA, SoundsTrue.com. You can find out all of the good information, the faculty, you can see the curriculum. And at that website, you'll find, you know, even if you have questions, there's a team of people that you can book a call with and get your questions answered. But it's all right there at uh, InnerMBA, SoundsTrue.com. And how long is the program for? It's a nine month program. Nine month. Wow. So it's a really long time. And it's actually from NYU. There's a there's an affiliation with NYU too. Mind, so a, mindful NYU, right? The mindful, there's a program at NYU called Mindful NYU. And so we also have some of the faculty from Mindful NYU that are also teaching some of the programs within the it. inner MBA. Excellent. So we've been, thank you so much for being here. We've been here with, oh, um, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. So we've been talking about the inner um, MBA with um, civil Chavis and um, make sure to check out the website and sign up. Thank you so much. Thank you.